<laughs> hey, hey, what's up, hey, ladies? Hi. Welcome to Can We Talk Sports. Hi. I'm Karen, aka yes. hey, Dog, K Dog. I'm gonna get that right. I'm gonna get that right. Right, K Dog. <laughs> and it's your girl, Kawashika. And it's Arisha, aka Icy of Icy Fashion. And I'm Carmen, aka Mama D. And we wow. are. Can we talk sports? Can we talk right. sports? Mom. Hey, you guys. What has been going on? You know, the sports world is going crazy. We had the first week of high school football, and I'm sad to say the Soto lost. And I'm just like, what is going on? But what has been going on in you guys' world? Well, you go. Y'all already it. know. <laughs> It's about that time. Yes. Yeah. Oh, baby, it's football. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm getting prepared for this weekend, first game. Um, uh, USC plays San Jose. Ooh. Okay. Uh, so I am excited. I am excited, guys. I'm excited. And I will be in Lawrence, Kansas this weekend. University of Kansas opens their home opener with their new coach, Coach Leopold. They're going to be playing South Dakota. So that's how okay. you starts out with a good season this year. Yeah. Because yeah. Right. South Dakota is, a, you know, they Pretty normally team. make it to the playoffs every yeah. year, even though it's yeah. cold up there. I don't know what mama was in that baby up there, but uh, they got yeah. a good football team. Mama yeah, too, they, want their kids to play. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. So that's what we're gonna be doing this weekend. I'm gonna be. They're having Friday night lights this week, so I don't get to go to the Soto's game because this week, for the first two games, Kansas is playing on Fridays. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Wow. 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 Chapter wow. number eighteen, and then number two, my godson, <laughs> number eighteen and two. Wait, don't we got one more uh, Soto player in Kansas? Oh yeah, Maje. Yes, Maje. Our lineman, Maje, number fifty-five. That's right. We yeah, the Soto, is the Soto loaded, right. baby. There you go. Yes, it is. Well, hey, you I'm guys. Here. Um, you guys, be sure to like our video, share our video, uh, comments. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. You know, you guys, we are bringing this information for you guys. We are sports mom that love to share in that love to share resources and information. And we love to bring people to you who can add value to you in order for you to make an informed decision. So come on, like and share and comment and join us. Carmen, you were going to say what you were up to? Um, yeah, I'll be in uh, North Carolina this weekend. My my nephew, my brother's son, who played, my brother that played professional football for the Giants, his son plays for Elon University. So he has his first game. I'll be watching him play this weekend. All right. That's going to be okay. awesome. That's amazing. So we're going to be busy, guys. We got a busy week going on here. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm gonna be out of town, you guys. I'm gonna be really sad. I got one more trip. Uh, I gotta go to Miami. I'm going to Millions Conference, and so I'm not gonna be able to go to no football game, but I'm gonna be watching it on Saturday. I'm gonna be watching, but then I'll be back Friday next week. Arisha, hopefully, you'll be done with your game so we can show up at the Soto and represent. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yes. That's what we're going to do. So we got to represent because you know the baby's used to us on the 50-yard line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's so, right. So are we ready to um, tell them who our guest is today? Yes. Okay. Well, y'all, we have a guest. Familiar face. He may be familiar to y'all. He'll be joining us tonight. You've seen him on the NFL Network. Um, covering some of your favorite sports. Um, breaking the latest sports stories. You know, you may have heard of him on his own show called Huddle and Flow. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome NFL reporter and analyst Steve Winch. Watch, I don't know if I said it right, I'm sorry. Hopefully he'll let us call him Steve. 
Steve. Hey, hey, Steve. Okay, wait, wait. I'm, I'm, can I can I get on the roll call like you all? I'm Steve, yeah. aka, AKA Steve. Yeah. All right, and so, yeah. and this weekend I'm gonna be at Grambling versus Tennessee State in the Black Eyes okay. Football Hall of Fame Classic. Oh wow! Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. So now oh. can I be part of the club because that roll call you'll have. Yeah. 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 That is awesome. HBC, I know you are HBC, Howard University. Oh, we see you. We see you over there, Howard. <laughs> Representing. Oh, wow. So, you know, I think I saw an interview um, with you and a Gremlin alumni. And you guys were talking about HBCU and how the game is going to be on NFL Network, I believe. It is. How? On. You, got, you got you down there in DeSoto. Is Everson Walls, the legendary Dallas Cowboy? <laughs> yes, yeah. That Kawashika is a Cowboy fan. I'm a, I'm a Raider fan. <laughs> Miss Kim, are you not a Cowboy <laughs> fan? No, I have to follow my oh, husband. He's a Raider person. I need to be. I never knew that. Well, Kawash, Miss Karen, we need to put you to the bottom of the screen, and I need to be up there with Kawash because this cowboy is up top too. <laughs> I'm a diehard cowboy. I'm a diehard Cowboys fan. Yes. yes. Steve, what, who, who was your team? Steve? Who was your NFL team? Well, when I was growing up, I grew up in, um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, so I was a Vikings fan as a kid. So Ooh. you know, you know, I, I eventually moved to St. Louis. We lost our football team to Arizona. But I, you know, I grew up always loving the Vikings, and now that I cover it for a long time, I don't really have any okay. interest, you know, because coaches move, and you know, so much changes year to year. It's yeah. different than when I was young, you know. But I, I love the Vikings and the Purple People Eaters of Fran Tarkenton and all those guys. Oh, oh wow. wow! Okay, wow. we're gonna give you a pass, Dan. You look like you wiggled yourself out of that alone, you know, <laughs> right? right. Yeah. Not being able to name a team because yeah. you're a, a commentator, you can't name the team. No bias. <laughs> Wait, hold up, hold up. How's yeah. Miss? How's Miss? I'm going to Miami. Gonna throw some shade at me when all her girls are representing where they're going this weekend. She's like, um, I'm going, I'm going to Miami, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> to the millions conference. <laughs> to the millions conference. Yeah. Listen. Right. She was like, mm -hmm. I'm building yeah. my business in the dark. Miss Carrie, you about to, you better get ready for that. I'm gonna be ready. Welcome your seat. All right. I'm gonna be ready. I'm gonna be ready. <laughs> okay, so Steve, to get started out, we play a game called Would You Rather? So my question is, no, would you rather Plane, fly on vacation, or cruise? Oh, I am not taking a cruise after all this COVID <laughs> business. No, I'm, I'm flying I mean, wherever not, I have to go. <laughs> no. not, like, not like right this minute, but you know when things calm back down and like before all COVID started, would you still? I am not. I am not. I am not. A, I am not a cruise person. I don't want to be trapped like on, in the middle of the water with a bunch of people i really don't know i on a plane i can get on and off in like two hours on a cruise i could be stuck with some people who could be a little bit like rowdy and whatnot and i can't escape it <laughs> you could jump <laughs> <laughs> see see you all killing me already <laughs> we, get the, we, we get the interview you. Okay. right Rack. how is that you get to be interviewed versus being the interview right. I, love I love it i love it I have one. Would you rather be a high school teacher or a clown? <laughs> clown. Clown. All day. All day. Because I can have people laugh at me and, and do whatever. Those high school teachers, man, they they deserve so much respect and, and love and praise for what they have to go through trying to educate our, our young people and, you know, dealing with the parents who always got smoke for them. So, no, I would rather be a clown. I'd I don't got the patience anymore. Okay, well, I'm going to make mine a little tricky. Would you rather be without elbows or without knees? Ooh. <laughs> elbows? Because <laughs> at least I can walk to the store to get some fake arms. <laughs> so, you ready? You ready? Oh, you experienced over here. That's good. That's good. Ali, that's good. Yeah, you came with I didn't think you was going to have an answer for that one. I got an easy one. 
Would you rather stay in the city or the country? Wow, that's a great question because I grew up well outside the city. But I don't really like kind of the feel out there. So I'd say I'd probably stay in the city. But that's a tough one because I could probably have a bigger house out in the country. So, but I'll, say, I'll, I, I, yeah, I'll, still, I'll still say closer to the city. <laughs> Kasha, that, that was a good question because I would have to I really say the suburbs. Easy, like, the best, the best yeah. of both suburbs. Like, I don't well, know. Well, I would say he's not a country person. In case I need somebody. Oh. Like, I, they can't be like 10 minutes away before I can get to a neighbor. But I do like being outside of the city. Yeah. Yeah, we. I'm honestly a city girl, but I would love to experience the country. I'm country. I'm country. I'm country too. But you know they say we country though from Texas. I'm country. Look, I'm country. I'm from the home of the Friday Night Light, oh, that's the Permian Mojo. I'm just the. I'm from the state era when we were the when we were the mess. I almost right. said the wrong word. Yeah. I'm from the booby mouths area. Well, I'm okay. not that old, but that's my little plate. That's my god brother. Right. Okay. Well, Steve, let's get down to business. Listen, listen, listen. Um, I just want to ask the first question. I I, I know you played multiple positions in high school. Uh, what positions did you play? Well, I played high school football. I was always a quarterback most of my life. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, I was I was mostly a quarterback, but then I got banged up, banged up my shoulder a little bit. So of course, it limited what I could do. But I played quarterback, running back tight end and then you know when i was younger i was like a safety but as i got you know into my senior year and, and junior senior year i played defensive end slash outside linebacker which was a position i went on to college to play. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, well, now, which, yeah which was your favorite position and why you know i loved i love playing quarterback because that's a leadership position but it's also the one where every mistake comes down on you but i liked you know i kind of liked that responsibility yeah. But I also loved, you know, playing, you know, look, when I got on that defensive end outside linebacker spot, first time I ever played it, I had no idea what I was doing. I had the game of my life. <laughs> and, um, you know, so that was fun. So once I started learning it, it was really, you know, I really, really enjoyed it. So I, uh, you know, I started out at the University of Missouri. And, um, you know, the first time I got hit by a 300-pound pulling guard, I, re I decided I really didn't like the position as much as I thought I did. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I never hit like that before. <laughs> right. Wow. Wow. Like a truck. Right. Oh, you got a, hit by a fast truck. one. Yes. Exactly. So in college, what was the, your experience like as an athlete? Well, it was interesting, you know, because I was at the University of Missouri in the mid 80s. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it was interesting in a lot of different ways because I went, I went there. You know, to play football, of course, but they've got one of the better journalism schools in the country. I always knew I wanted to be a journalist. And so when I got there athletically, you know, there aren't the rules in place that there are now. Like you were, we were, we were on the field and practice field and workouts and meeting for 40 hours a week. I mean, it was a full time job. And so, you know, going there, you know, like I was big in high school in my position, like 205, 210 pounds. I get there and I'm greatly undersized for the position I played. So I spent all year in the weight room getting big and all of that. But, you know, I, I made some incredible friends. I learned some very difficult life lessons. Like where I went to high school is mainly like white kids. And so a lot of them went to the same university I did. And then when I got there, they were, I, I became the football player they knew instead of someone they've known since they were 10 years old. So I was like, ah, okay. So everything my parents have been telling me is starting to come to fruition, you know, which is why, you know, the great thing is after two years, when I, you know, the coaching staff that brought us in got fired. Um, so after two years, I was like, I'm transferring out. I'm going to go to a, a black, I'm going to go to an HBCU. I've never had that experience growing up. And so I went to Howard, was going to play football. Once I got there, I was like, you know what, let me just focus on the academics. And, uh, and it was, it was the, other than marrying my wife, the best decision I ever made in my life. Yeah. Wow. wow. So you talk wow. about coming from a, a white background. So what was the culture shock for? What was it like at Howard when you got there and you were like, whoa? Well, that's a great question because that was all. I think that, that was a, a lot of questions. A lot of students who go to HBCU ask, you know, who grew up in the suburbs or even on the outskirts of the suburbs where I grew up. 
And I was like, am I, you know, am I going to be black enough? Mm-hmm. And then you get there and you yeah. realize, yeah, there's a lot of other students coming from your situation. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you got kids from the inner city in New York, you got kids from, you know, the country in, in Georgia, you got kids, you know, coming from the suburbs of, you know, LA and, and Silver Spring, Maryland, and things like that. So you really, you know, you really get a good mashup. And to me, there's no such thing as being black enough because there's such diversity, as you know, in our culture mm-hmm. that we all add something to the jambalaya. And so when we come together, it ends up tasting really good. And that was that's why it was such a great experience at Howard academically, socially, um, being in D.C., you know, which at the time was Chocolate City. It's not anymore. It's Milk Chocolate City. And so <laughs> I'm just keeping it real. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and so you know it was just it was such it was right it, it, it was such a growth experience for me you know being this kid from suburban st louis to minneapolis to st louis and then going to dc and going to howard i was like man you know this is i i understand now why people talk about the hbcu experience and how it really makes him into a man or into a woman wow now what you said you after two years you changed over to uh, academically and and you made it sound like it was just a smooth transition and so that's some of the things that as moms have pro- um, problems with their kids as far as sports being their identity so obviously you had a balance to know that there was something else you wanted to do other than just play sports so can you kind of tell us about was it hard or easy to make that decision? Because I don't know how long you played sport. Did you play it ever since you was little? Yeah. But that was a transition right there. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I've never I've never been asked that question. I, and I appreciate you asking because, you know, my parents were divorced uh, when I was in elementary school. So my mother raised me. I, even when my father was home, he was always gone traveling or, or doing whatever. So my mother raised me. And, and she made sure that, hey, if she's going to go to work from eight to five, then the kitchen better be clean. You know, the rooms better be clean. And I was and I was the man of the house, right? I was the middle child, but I was the man of the house. So she really relied on me. And, you know, I really took responsibility in bettering myself seriously from a young age. You know, and then I saw her as she was kind of struggling to pay the bills and do that, always try to make herself better, take classes and do things to make my, you know, make things better. So it was kind of an inherent thing where I didn't have to be told to cut the grass or I didn't have to be told to do certain things. And so there was always this feeling of at some point I've got to repay my mother in some way, shape or form. So don't be a, don't be a pain. Don't be that kid that my mom's got to tell me to study. You know, don't be that guy who she's got to tell me to work harder because she works harder than anybody I've ever seen. So I, I you know, I had that very close, you know, I, I could eyeball that, you know, and I could always see strengths and weaknesses in everything I did. And, you know, it was always just kind of a repayment to my mother, which is why I'm so glad I'm on the show with you wonderful ladies. It was always, you know, an homage to my mother my whole life. And so when I stopped playing athletics, I mean, I was always good. I always worked hard. I, I played year round. I trained year round. But when I, you know, I called my mom up this, this day and I said, look, I'm done. I'm done playing sports. I'm not going to make in the NFL. My body's beat up. I just, I just want to be a student. She was like, good for you. You know, you can always go back. You still have eligibility. If you want to try, you can go walk on whatever, but I really respect you in doing that. So it was, it wasn't difficult. I, I didn't identify myself as that. I always knew I wanted to be like Brian Gumble or some, someone like that because you come to the reality at some point of your life as an athlete that you're not going to be doing this forever. And I happened to come to mind when I was about 20 years old. <laughs> so did something in particular happen that made you feel I'm done with uh, sports and this is it? Did anything in particular happen? Was your Because this is weird. I just was talking to a friend about mental health. And sometime to me, and this is just what I've kind of seen with being around it, some of the guys that seem like they can't let go of the sport, part of it is because maybe they're situate, everybody's situational. Like if a coach didn't give them an opportunity, then maybe they feel like they can still go because they never got the chance to show what it is that they 
could really do. You know what I mean? They they probably feel like I still have something to prove. I, I got to show what I have, but maybe the coach or the team they were on, that coach didn't give them the chance to um, to get on the field like they were supposed to. You know what I mean? So was it something in particular that let you know I'm done, it's time to move to something else? That's a great question um, because I've seen so many guys do it. Look, so many guys didn't, don't, didn't have options, right? Like they had that scholarship. And at the time I was going through it, the transfer rules aren't like there was no transfer portal. You had to sit out a year. Yeah. Right. So a lot of a lot of students, you know, if they wanted to transfer, a lot of athletes didn't know if they were going to have that scholarship to tide them over a semester, right? So they just wrote it out because that scholarship was their only way to get through. Right. Or they didn't want or they could have transferred, but they didn't want to move too far away from home because they had a child there or their mother, somebody was relying on them. So for me, I was always very self-assured of, of myself. I've been very blessed that way. Again, like you heard me mention strengths and weaknesses. I've always known my strengths and I try to really, you know, minimize yet enhance, you know, the, the parts to, to you know, my weaknesses. Yeah, I'm going to do this, but I'm really going to play to my strengths. Yeah. And so when I made the decision, it was, like I said, the coaches got fired. Yeah. And it, here I was a comeback for that next year. I'm strong enough. I'm big enough. The assistant coaches really see that, okay, he's kind of ready, right? We can kind of get him into the rotation now. Yeah. But I wasn't I wasn't one of the new coaches guys. And they were very they were very honest about that. Like, look, you're not mm -hmm. a starter yet. Maybe you're you're headed that way, but it's not going to be for us because we're going to develop our own guys. We'll help you transfer. So I was fortunate enough to have people who were very frank with me and honest with me, you know, and yeah. that's rarely the case in major college athletics. You know, they're going to lie to a kid for as long as possible just to say, hey, we, we kept this guy. We treated him well, whatever. Um, and so, again, I was – was a very personal thing to me like you know just kind of let me go and they were like great we'll we'll help you with whatever you can do so i was really appreciative of that and you know when i went to howard the coach that was there had recruited me when he was at a different school he wanted me to come play and like in about the three month lag time from when i decided to transfer to when i actually got there to use football vernacular i lost my stinger oh, and i was yeah. kind of like you know i was kind of like you know i'm done because i was one of these guys i had to really lift to keep weight on you know it'd be 230 yeah. 235 i had to constantly mm -hmm. keep at it i weight. was kind of tired of it. yeah i mean weights he died I, I was kind of done with that part. burned out yeah and so you know by the time i got on that campus it was like this is different y'all <laughs> <laughs> yeah. lady, lady different. know what i'm talking about i don't know like <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> but you know in your life kind of represent the example that kids can take from even though you play sport you found a job still in that world of sports and so it's almost like even if i don't become a professional i still can be uh over the stadium or i could be a gm or i could be a coach and and that's the kind of thing that we want to share with our parents, you know, there are still other options other than yeah. being the actual athlete. That there's a million options, and, and I work and I work with a lot of universities on this, um, especially HBCUs in particular. But there's so many different things because more and more schools have sports management undergraduate degrees. When I was coming up, there's only three or four schools who had that as a master's degree. So now they have it as an undergraduate degree, and here is where these teams. And, and let's also get away from teams. You know, there's Gatorade, there's Nike, yes. there's mm. yeah, there's Titleist golf golf apparel, right? There's all yeah. kind of different things that we have to think about now that impact people, right? Lululemon, right? Who makes the workout apparel gear that's mm. so popular? These are ways that you can stay in the sports world. Mm -hmm. Use your accounting degree, right? There's there's yeah. use your math degree. There's, analytics is huge on how. Hey, we've got this demographic that buys this type of apparel or likes to attend these types of events. Here's how we can monetize this. There's so many different ways outside of even getting into coaching or scouting or yeah. anything like that where you can make tons of money and be yeah. very and very happy with the hours and the type of lifestyle you'd be able to live. They have that work-life balance that aren't directly impacted by you trying to get in as a coach or a scout. Because that, hey, that is just as hard 
is finding an opportunity as a player. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about marketing? Exactly. One hundred percent. Yes. One hundred percent marketing, especially now they have these NIL deals. Yeah. With colleges. I mean, you have you could have some creative branding with a college student. It doesn't have to be a major deal. Hey, look, we're going to pay you ten thousand dollars you to come and do some appearances with this stuff or or if you wear this apparel or you can yeah. come to our restaurant. There's all kinds of different ways. That you, I mean, basically anything you can think of, any type of Fortune 500 company, you can apply to something affiliated with sports that can really keep you connected and kind of right. scratch that itch. Even if it's just mm -hmm. being around or being at a stadium or an arena on any given day, there's so many different occupations um, that, you can, that you can be involved with. And you don't even have to go to college for a lot of them. sound engineers, yeah. you know, who work the microphones and the soundboards and stuff at games. There's so many different things you can do. Mm -hmm. When do you mm -hmm. advise, when, what advice could you give like for the, 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 the athletes? When is, when would you say they should start trying to hone in on those, you know, other opportunities? Should they do it while they're being the athlete or should they kind of like, you know, sometimes people wait till it's too late and they start late. Like, I don't, well, well, when would you say they should start? Early Th in the thank you, because or what? Early, early in the college, especially now, again, that, that these college athletes can get paid through these NIL opportunities. There's creative ways, even if you get internships, you know, yeah. like, okay, so you're going to pay me so much to do, you know, forget even getting paid. Mm -hmm. Get internships at NFL programs or Major League Baseball, whatever you want to do. One of the exploding things is, is, is Major League Soccer going around. More and more teams have that. And even if you don't know anything about soccer, get in the building and you can learn mm -hmm. about public relations, marketing, things like that. And you can see how that can apply just about anywhere, but do it, especially while you're an athlete, because then you can capitalize on your likeness. Yeah, People want to be around athletes. Yeah. People true. want to be around athletes. I don't care if you're Division Three, Division Two, major college, high school. People want to rub shoulders with you. Mm -hmm. And that is when you take care because you made a great point. I'm around so many NFL athletes who come into our studios when they're 32, 33, thinking that they can just, okay, when I'm done playing, I can go to television. Okay. There ain't many jobs available. <clears throat> There's not many jobs available. And when you've got 500 people out of the league every year in the NFL and there's 15 jobs available, odds are against you. Mm -hmm. So you better start doing things to capitalize on your likeness and your popularity while you're a player to where these networks or whomever, like, I, I want to be around this guy. You know, so when he's finished, I, I want this person to be part of my family. Because if you wait until it's too late, <laughs> someone's going to come in and steal your thunder. <clears throat> wow. Uh, I have I want to go back to that question about the HBCUs being on the NFL network and how his how his historic that is. I mean, I don't know why it took so long, but you know, what's your thoughts about that? Well, we started this program in large part um, because me being an HBU graduate, I'm banging on doors saying, "Do you understand the history of historically black colleges? Ten percent of the Pro Football Hall of Fame." played at historically black colleges. You know, you look seeing all these black quarterbacks in the NFL today. Yeah, they may not have gone to Grambling or Jackson State or whatever, but they probably know somebody in their family who did or talked about it or saw Walter Payton or Jerry Rice and all these guys who did this stuff. So, you know, there, there's some opportunities here. As you see this helmet right here, this is from the Black College Football Hall of Fame. Okay, I'm on the selection committee where we put guys in the Hall of Fame every year, <clears throat> and it's an endless list of just great – players who attended black historically black colleges. So now we have opportunities like the Black College Football Hall of Fame Classic. This would be the second time we've done it. We were going to do it last year, but a COVID struck. The week after the Super Bowl, we have the HBCU Legacy Bowl, right, mm -hmm. where we're going to have 100 draft, up to 100 draft eligible players playing a game at Tulane University in New Orleans. Again, this is the week after the Super Bowl, but they'll have a week of practices where they get to showcase themselves in front of NFL scouts and Canadian Football League scouts and XFL scouts. We're going to be doing reports from there. So, you know, you're seeing the NFL Network broadcast games. ESPN mm -hmm. last week, the regular ESPN showed Alcorn State versus yeah. North Carolina Central. Yeah. They're broadcasting up to 30 games from HBCUs 
this year. So there's a renaissance in, in black colleges. It really happened over the past two or three years where students who used to want to go to the University of Michigan now are applying to go sure. to Howard, to Hampton, to Morgan State. People feeling a little bit more comfortable in the surroundings, understanding that the vice president of this country mm -hmm. attended an HBCU. So maybe right. they can then, so maybe they can as well. So this is where some of the athletic visibility is piggybacking off of some of the visibility that Kamala Harris and some right. of those Chadwick Bozeman and all of these great Taraji P. Henson and, and all of these celebrities now who are representing they're uh oh we got somebody big mama representing I see you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Big mama. These are broken fingers, by the way. So, right. <laughs> but, but you know, it's, you know, it's it's just part of you know. I think we're capitalizing on the moment, and now you know, TV is they want to capitalize on the moment, right? Where's right. the momentum? Yes. So let's right. get on these. So let's get on these mm -hmm. black colleges. Deion Sanders at Jackson State. Eddie George. Oh, yes. He's yeah. coaching at Tennessee State. You know, Tyrone yes. Wheatley, he's coaching at Morgan State. So let's yes. let's capitalize on that. Now, I heard you say how this last Hall of Fame, we had four HBCU uh, inductees. And I'm like, eventually, there's not going to be any more because our kids have all went to the Power Five. I forgot what they call them. Um, so what is it that we need to tell our kids? Is it like putting the pride back into HBCU what is missing? What what I I, I can uh, let me go back to me when my son was uh, being recruited. For some reason, I didn't consider HBCU. I don't even know why. I know why because everything I see on TV is the Oregon, the USC, and of course, I think that's where the, he has to go in order for him to be seen. Because I didn't see Gramlin and Perry View on TV. That's what we yeah, see. That's true. And so, but when I went to a Gramlin and Perry View game, I was like, I'm grueling. Because <laughs> right. I loved it. I'm like, what the hell was I thinking about? I should have been telling my kids, go to HBCU. He probably would have stayed there and played and graduated. Right. We, I just well, missed the boat on it. But no, it's all no, because of what I was don't, seeing. But don't don't feel don't feel alone. In that, I mean, like I said, when I was getting recruited, I grew up in outside of St. Louis, right? There's only one HBCU west of the Mississippi River in that part of the country. That's Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. I, and they don't have the budgets, right? I never got a letter from Grambling or Tennessee State. You know, so I, I never they, – they don't have the budgets to go out and recruit. Those are starting to increase with some of the apparel money, the Nike money, and things like that. But those HBCUs, they still have to fund a lot of other programs. Right, so they can't. I mean, what Nick Saban makes in a year is the athletic budget of most HBCUs, where they've got to put on basketball games, men's and women's, and softball and track and field, and so that's part of it. But here's again this exposure now: Dion Sanders yeah. coming to Jackson State again. Mm -hmm. What that's doing now is now ESPN is showcasing 30 HBCU football games this year, so you can see it. Yeah. Right? And that's where my We're revenue saying, is coming to. That's where the revenue. So McCour Maker, okay, who was one of the top five college recruits in basketball, went to Howard last year. Unfortunately, the season got canceled because of COVID. COVID. So now he's deciding to go to another university where he can get that visual exposure. But we have got to maybe at the at the at the very least consider going to an HBC, right? We know you can go to Alabama. You might have to sit for a year, year or two. But you know what? If you go to Alabama A&M, you could be that dude. And yeah. you know what? If you're that dude, the scouts are going to find you. And, they're you know, gonna I'm going gonna, I'm yeah. gonna, to gonna disagree when you say that the pipeline is ending. Because right now, Darius Leonard, who went to South Carolina State, a middle linebacker for the Indianapolis Colts, just signed the largest contract extension for a player at his position, right? Wow. We've got Titus Howard who I think mm. Titus went to Alabama A&M, starts a left tackle mm. for the Houston Texans. So there are players there. The problem is the NFL scouts are not paying as much due diligence to these universities. So yeah. when Georgia has its pro day, they've got to take on kids from Albany State and Fayetteville State because those little schools, the NFL is not going to see them. So after they go visit the big kids from Georgia, they're kind of like, okay, who are these guys? Let's keep it moving. Right which is why we're having the HBCU Combine this year. 
at the same time as a senior bowl, which is why we're having a legacy bowl this year to give them television exposure, firsthand exposure, and not just the players, the mm-hmm. coaches, the trainers, mm-hmm. the PR people that we were just talking about, these ancillary employees who can benefit from this type of exposure. So this, these are the things where we've got to get the momentum started and keep on pushing that ball downhill because for too long we've been trying to push it uphill. Mm-hmm. And now is the opportunity where we've got to seize the moment, which is why I'm so glad that you all are talking about this and you recognize it when you went to that Grambling PVU game and were up there <laughs> like this. Imagine being 18 or 19 rocking it like yeah. that. <laughs> Battle of Look, the it's fun. It's fun. You, look, you know why we talking about it, Steve? Because we're she SPN. That's right. right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I see. That's it. I yeah. love it. I love it. I They're gonna love see it. us soon. They're gonna see us soon right there up there. Yeah, you know, yeah, right. with, with the big dogs. She SPN. You remember that. <laughs> so, Steve, right. I have a question yeah, for you. I know you've done a lot of interviews and you've covered a lot of stories. Tell us about your most difficult story that you've had to mm. to talk about, and also the most exciting story you had to cover. Well, the biggest story I've ever done is, I, you know, I broke the Colin Kaepernick story. I was the reporter who did not see, you know, who saw him not standing for the national anthem, and of course, we've seen the impact that that story has had on all forms of media, society, and culture. So wow. that's by far the, the biggest story that I've, that I've covered and done and, and still talking about it today, which I'm very proud of, right. not because of what I did. I just did my job, but for a young person taking that stance and having such a historical influence. The most difficult story I've ever had to do was when I was working in Atlanta when I was a writer and the Michael Vick dogfighting story, right? Here's, oh, here's the most popular football player in the NFL, $100 million contract, and come to find out he's fighting dogs. The city of Atlanta was split in half, and it was awful. You had friends who no longer spoke to each other over this because some people like, oh, he just was doing this with dogs, and other people like, I'm not having it. And, and, I, and I have to explain this to people like, okay, we hear of rapes and violent crimes, but how many people do we honestly know or are directly affected by this, or do we know anyone who's been murdered or jailed because of murder? Not that many, if any. But we've all petted dogs. Or we've all had a cat, right? So that's why this the story struck such a nerve, and it was so it was so interesting being in the newspaper game, where all they saw was the byline, and so for two weeks people were like, "Oh, you're racist! You're coming after Michael Vick! You're part of that whole Southern Atlanta clan!" And then they saw me, and then white folks were like, "See, that's why you're writing so many favorable stories about Michael Vick." I'm like, "It's the same stuff." <laughs> Same story, and, but, both sides. But it, but, it, but it went on for seven, eight months. And in the meantime, you know, I'm covering a football team. I hire this coach, Bobby Petrino, who quits on the team after 13 games. The team is terrible. Every day there's protesters outside. I mean, every day. And the fact that the crimes took place in Virginia and I'm in Georgia reporting, that was difficult. But, you know, the fact that I got all these gray hairs uh, <laughs> covering that story. You know, I'm, I'm really proud of the, of the work that me and my partner did on that. And I think the most proud thing um, that's come out of all of this is, you know, I spoke to Mike. You know, we did a piece probably two or three months ago where we talked about it. Like, Mike, you know, this was this is horrible. You know, you you had to go to jail for this. You you went through all this. But, you know, here I am having to cover this. And you and me were cool. Right. And I'm having to I'm find out you're killing dogs this way and that way. And like, it's mortifying. And, you know, it was a very good, healthy conversation where it was like, hey, we've, we've both grown so much from then, you know, and especially see a young black man make that mistake, acknowledge it, go to jail, serve his time and to come back and, and get able to ch- a chance to play in the NFL yeah, again yeah, yeah. Uh, was, was something that, you know, was really, you know, it meant a lot, it, it meant, it meant a, you know, a lot to me. Yeah, that's good. I yeah. remember that. Unfortunately, I don't like dogs that much, so it wouldn't have been. <laughs> stop, <laughs> stop. No, no, stop. I'm about to get, no, about to get some hate no, mail. Parents. You stop. don't get us about to get some people throwing stuff at your house. I'm telling you right now, don't say it. Do Look, he knows. It. Look, take that advice from Steve. Listen, don't he was it. the man. That He was the man back then. I don't know what yeah. y'all talking about. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of players that emulate him right now. 
Mm-hmm. What about so? What about your new? What's what's the, what's going on with your new po- podcast? Yeah, this is yeah. interesting. So last no. last year, my my fellow Howard University brother Jim Trotter and I had the Huddle and Flow podcast. It was a just it was one of the greatest things to kind of hit this medium because we spoke on issues like we're speaking today. We we kept it real. Um, you know, we we got black coaches on it and white owners on why they're not hiring black coaches. The unfortunate thing, the unfortunate thing is it doesn't look like we're coming back. Um, I can't get too much into detail, and it's not anything between me and Jim and our producer, Thomas Warren. We are brothers forever. We love each other. It has nothing to do with us. Um, but it's unfortunate because the platform we were able to give a lot of people um, is not going to be there. Um, but we're very proud of the work we did and some of the change we helped influence um, and some of the attention we were able to bring to a lot of issues. But it is just unfortunate that in uh, this time of 2021, it will not be back. I, I will leave it right oh, there. I'm going oh, to take my advice that I just gave you about the dog. Right. And keep it. <laughs> just keep you it know, I, I looked at the picture and uh, I said, I wonder, did he tell them to make his muscles the picture of the of the uh, <laughs> your muscles? Was, I, was like, you can't see. I was like, did he make his muscles bigger? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't see him. I'm she got a little shiny, Steve. I don't know why she after you today, but she got <laughs> right. no, You know what? You know what? Hey, you know what? The whole team can be down in Miami, like ah, ah, all these people doing is I'm down in Miami kicking it. I got on Steve. Yeah, she can be at the Grambling yeah. Prairie View game this year doing like this again. Yeah. 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 All right, Karen. Karen. <laughs> Karen. Karen. <laughs> Karen, yeah. Oh, woo. Well, uh, just to put this in there, since you're not coming on the podcast, your podcast is not coming back on, you can definitely shoot all your people over to Can We Talk Sports? Say, we got some sports mom over there that's doing it, and they yeah. need some people to follow them. You, like, you get all on that, she, yeah, she SPN. I will, I will absolutely direct them this yes. way. <laughs> I got I to gotta warn them that the smoke – the smoke is real. <laughs> it's really going, going to be real. Yep, yeah, because we're going up and up. <laughs> right. What talking about? I love it. I love it. Stay on to watch uh, Big Mama. Uh, yeah, uh, she's, yeah. She has a really that good part. segment. So, coming up, you guys, I'm really excited. You know, it's one of my favorite parts. Big Mama is on her way, so get ready. Hey, Big Mama. Oh, she trying with dirty. Hey, girl. ladies. Hey, Steve. Got that hair Hi, up, yo. Big, Big Mama. Great interview. <laughs> I enjoyed it. You guys are the best. I am loving this. No, on uh, Saturday. Um, are you? Are you? Are you done Saturday. with me? Yes, yes. You're not trying to leave us, Steve, are you? No, no, no. I said no because I know Big Mama's got her segment, so I didn't know if you guys were. Talking oh yeah. No, right. you need. Yeah, Big Mama. I enjoyed yeah. you guys. But Steve, for Saturday, GS, GS, GS. <laughs> you, you, you. I thought you knew. Are you yeah, going? I'm from the boo, baby. It's Big Mama. I hear you. That's I my family's you. alma mater. My mom, the uncles, the aunts, everybody. But Karen said something very important. All my life, it was grambling. Every football game, every uh, Bayou Classic, we were there. When I got ready to go to college, I just knew it was grambling. My mom said no. I went to Gremlin because I didn't have a choice, but I want something a little different for you. And I really want to say it's because of that mentality that a lot of our children have uh, avoided that uh, the HBCUs. And she really did that. And when I get with my friends, I I don't. I'm like I I missed out on all of that. But There's a lot of people who believe that HBCUs things. don't prepare you for the real world. I, I'd say completely the contrary. Because you're never going to be around that environment again. Exactly. 
And exactly. you are so much more aware of life by going to an HBCU yes. than, yes. than when you go to a PWI. Mm -hmm. So we got to change that mm -hmm. thinking, ladies. It's important. Yes. It's important. Oh, yes, definitely. All right, ladies, All right. I'm ready to start my segment. Um, good, good evening, everybody. You are with Big Mama. I just want to say real quick, uh, shucks. Just want to say real quick, it has been a busy week. So much is going on. Uh, I know that they alluded to uh, Coach Nick Saban and Coach Deion Sanders, but they're doing a collaboration with AFLA. And, and we've seen uh, Coach Saban being the spokesperson for AFLA for a long, long time. And now he is bringing uh, Coach Sanders on the scene. So that's going to give a lot more exposure to our HBCU. And I'm excited about that, about them getting together to collaborate. Uh, the next thing I have, I only have three things. That's one. My next thing, uh, Cam New. So, Cam, I know you got cut today. Big Mom is in prayer for you. Don't worry. But you, you they want to say that it's your COVID, uh, that you violated the COVID-19 rule. Uh, but we kind of really didn't know what was going on with you. We saw you out, out there working or what have you. And I know you've gotten um, a little bit of rap. But uh, I hear that maybe uh, the Cowboys might want you to come down there since they dismissed them. They're a uh, quarter, backup quarterback today. But one thing that Jerry is out, out there saying, he says that if you, you want to be a Dallas Cowboy, you got to be vaccinated. He says that's what we're going to do here. Uh, if you want to come here? That's what's going to happen. Now, I don't know if Jeremy, uh, Jerry is calling you, but um, I hope you get landed somewhere. You get a home and all is well. But oh, uh, also to the Dallas Cowboys, my New Orleans Saints have uh, due to a hurricane. We're definitely praying for all of those affected by it. Uh, my Saints had to come up here to practice huh, in Cowboy Stadium. So I'm just, uh, I hope don't nothing just, you know, I just hope don't nothing get on them over there and that all is well but uh so shout out to uh the cowboys uh group for, for opening up their home to us uh from louisiana a lot is going on so we want to keep everybody in prayer but my last thing i want to talk about is bishop sycamore so i'm gonna put my hand on my face because you know when big mama want to talk to you about something so this, this is bishop sycamore there in ohio uh, they fooled ESPN, saying that they were such a uh, a noteworthy school and that they, they had all these D1 players. I just don't know how you fooled ESPN. Somebody at ESPN vetted it. So I, we won't put all the blame on Coach Johnson, even though we know he's doing something, something that's going on with him, uh, with this. He said it's a non-traditional high school. Uh, parents, before you let your children go and participate in any program, vet it. Know what's going on. Find out who's who and what, what is really happening. Uh, from every story that I've read that he has these older and younger guys, but they were coming to Texas. And they were coming to play Duncanville High School in Texas. Don't mess with Texas. So we canceled. You won't be coming to Texas. But one thing this season, Big Mama is always talking to you about is balance. Parents, make sure that your children have balance in their lives and that you as well. But remember, balance is not something that you find. Balance is something that you create. So that's all Big Mama has for you this week. And y'all have a good week, baby. Everybody unmute yourself because I had she everybody said, muted. Uh, Big Mama said, what's his, what's his name that got released today? Cam, Cam Newton. Newton. Cam Newton. She said, Cam Newton, uh, Dallas uh, Cowboys, he can come over there if he get vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> leave my boy. Look, I'm a Cowboy fan, but I love Cam Newton. Leave him alone. No, I like I'm, Cam I, Newton too. Yes, 
I'm with him too, but it's just the way Big Bubba said it. Are you over there like, crying? Did Jerry Jones really say that? <laughs> she's, look, she's crying, laughing. I saw tears on her face. Steve, why are you ducking your head like that? You to get... <laughs> Big Mama said she hoped don't nothing get on the same get on from the couch. <laughs> she's wrong for that. <laughs> Big Mama, you wrong for that. You know I love you, but you wrong for that. Oh. <laughs> Watch her face look wet. She's been crying, laughing. So you got you, uh, Jim Jones said you got to be vaccinated. You come to Dallas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Did, anyway. did, you, did you guys see the interview when um when uh Zeke they were interviewing him and they they were asking him about vaccinations and he's like, you know, it's everybody's choice. Some people don't get vaccinated for reasons, whatever. And then they ask him, Well, you know, they said that if your team gets COVID, you're gonna lose a paycheck. And he was like, Huh? huh? Paycheck? <laughs> 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 yeah, so but Big Mama came in great and, and she put her pointers down and gave us um her input on everything. We just are so happy we that Steve, you took the time out today to come sit with us and see our podcast and give us the pointers that you did and we appreciate you being here and we enjoyed you. Yeah. And um we hope to have you come back on again soon at some point. Yes. I would love to, and thank absolutely. you guys so much for having me. It was absolutely spectacular. You guys are the best. GSPN, you guys got a great <laughs> thing going. Hey, hey, Karen, Karen, holla at your boy. I'm out. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> From All right. yeah, and so before I forget, you guys, we do have, um, if there's anyone who wants to be a sponsor or anything, you know, D, uh, uh, Email us at can we talk sports at gmail if you have a business that you want to promote or even come on the show, you know, come on, you know, and um, you want to just be a sponsor and support can we talk sports, um, send, a, send the email. And I also want to add a parent tip of the week. Um, one of them, I know one of my main things that I've been really honing in on is mental health for your kids. But also, I guess this goes hand in hand on what one of the topics can be, which is um, the discipline, um, you know, how, you know, about the viral video about coaches discipline their um, football uh, coach. I mean, I'm sorry, the coaches discipline their students or their athletes or whatever. And, you know, there was a different, little bit of different feedback, you know, um, on it. Um, you know, how do you feel about coaches disciplining your, your child? I mean, I guess it's, you know, as long as they don't, old, like they say, OD on it. To me, that that involves mental health. It's one thing to discipline a kid. It's another thing to, like, kind of, you know, belittle them to make them feel like they're nothing because that's where, to me, mental health is important. And I just, like, that is something that I really think needs to be more involved with um, football, whether it's high school or college, you know you know make sure your kid is okay you know continue parents continue to check in with your kid because sometimes the sport makes them po feel like they have to be tough that they can't express themselves to their parents or whatever they feel like it's pouting or crying but um try to help your kid understand the difference it's not pouting it's not being weak by speaking up to the coach or speaking up to the parent and i mean it's in a respectful manner to to find out what's what you know and if the coach is not um open to that then you know maybe at that point you may have to go in with a parent coach thing in high school you know uh but to me you know the discipline is not a problem because you know that's part of life but you have to also make sure it's not something that's belittling and messing with your child's mental health good point good point great hey, amen that's good it's a thin line between love and hate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like a song. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's true though, because you got some coaches that will literally take a handle some of these student athletes as it pers really personal. You know, it's like you've seen them go overboard with them. You know, to where now this yeah. kid is questioning themselves. You wonder why a kid ends up in the hospital. Are, are hurting himself and you wonder what made this kid decide to take his life 
-hmm. you know, so I yeah. just think some of these coaches, they're so everybody wants to have a job, but some coaches just go overboard and, and, and it's just not right. You know, I, I, it's a lot of, I think that's something that needs to be put in the curriculum <clears throat> when student athletes come in, just like they make them do these, um, any, I'm sure any of y'all who have students that's been in college, they give them this survey to do about making sure they understand the difference with um, sexual harassment or alcohol oh. usage, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. There needs to be, you know, some type of survey, but I feel like an in-person uh, in person type situation where mm -hmm. somebody is in there once or twice a month, if so, if not a week, you know, like a class. You have to go yeah. in here. That's a, that's a mental health check. And I just think mm -hmm. that they so focus on the athlete, I mean, the sports so much, especially in football, that they don't care about how the kid feels. They think they're out there in pads every week and they're okay. But that's they good. Have to check them out. Uh, you know, in, in our jobs, you know, there's train, there's classes that we have to take to signs of harassment, signs of abuse and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So, yeah, there was a video that the kids would sign off on when you this is when the coach is going or facility people have gone too far, too far you know, because yeah. some people just they think that they have to take it because they want to play the game. And so. That was my point to Karen. Um, as parents, we have to be able to allow these kids to speak up for themselves. Yeah. They have to be able to say, you know what? The way you're talking to me, it's not acceptable. Like, I know you're my coach. I'm going to respect you, but you're not going to belittle me. You're not going to talk down to me. And these kids have to be able to have a voice. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we can teach them to be, you know, meek and respectful and all that. But we also need to teach them to speak up for themselves That's when right. they're being mistreated. Mistreated, because at yeah. the end of the day, they're they're considered adults at this point, young adults. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah, and Arisha. the coach don't want mama and daddy coming in there. The 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 nope. once they're in college, they have to speak up for themselves. We we they got to speak up for themselves. Yeah, we can't. I, reach, I got a video that I think that uh, will be very that will be a witness for you. Um, it's a video about walk ons. Mm -hmm. Well, yesterday, the BYU football program made national headlines with their historic NIL agreement where a local company built bars announced it would pay the tuition for all 36 walk on players. The reaction was priceless. It went viral as these kids who work just as hard as the scholarship players but have to pay their own way found out their tuition would be taken care of. With the new name, image, and likeness deals, players are able to earn money from companies and these, this unique deal that really helps the walk-ons could become a trend across the country. I can't watch the video. Every time I watch the video, I get emotional. You know, it was a, something I've been waiting for for a long time and just finally happy to you know be a part of a family and feel wanted it takes stress off for sure you know my mom and my dad don't have to pay for any tuition one of the more special things of yesterday was like hearing my name get called up was amazing but as i mentioned when i heard the rest of the the walk-ons when they all stood up like that's when the emotions just got the best of me and i just saw all my all my brothers you know what about a business coming in and not just affecting the one but affecting the entire team I mean, I think that's the conversation we need to start having to help these kids, to help these student athletes go make a change out in the world because these are future leaders. What a moment that must have been for them. In return, the walk-ins have to wear the built brand logo on their helmets during practice and make a couple of appearances at the company. But this is getting national attention for making such a difference in these kids' lives. Just w what a move by built brand. Kudos to them. Yeah. Wow. wow. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. Me too. I see. Oh, that was amazing. You know, oh we God, as moms, amazing. we've watched these kids that were walk on and they play for two or three years before. You're <laughs> <to Tara. laughs> 
We're moms. I would love to see. I would love to see more companies jumping on the bandwagon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I'm a crybaby. Crap. Me too. <laughs> Me that, too. That, I'm a cry that's baby. amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. Just think when you got that call, mm -hmm. you know that call, and 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 your kid tell you that mom, my tuition is paid, mom. Man, that that would be so, that would be so awesome. Mm -hmm. Real moms, real stories. <laughs> really, that, that was a good one. Yeah, that was yeah. really good. I know mine waiting. Yeah. Ooh, I got chills. Yeah. Let's go well, come. guys, I enjoyed y'all. <laughs> well, thank y'all. This was a good show. <laughs> it was an excellent yeah. show. I really enjoyed yeah. Steve. I really I enjoyed too. his input. He had some really good yeah. information, especially about our black colleges. Like, we have to support our black colleges. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It just blesses me to see. I see the same thing happening to black colleges that we saw happen a few years ago with black films. Like, you know, people always said, we can't, we're not going to support black films. People are not going to come see black films. Right. Well, now they know yeah. better. And that's the same yeah. thing with black colleges. Yeah, yes. he's on the move with that. So I know everything he touch. <laughs> he going to mm -hmm. make it happen, not just by himself, but I know he's been on the forefront of it. So yeah, yeah. hopefully we can get him on the show soon. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Be sure to like and share this video. If you know a parent that is a, a sports mom that um, needs the resource, needs to know information, um, tell them about the show. If you know someone that would be good to come on the show, tell them about the show. If you're on YouTube, please like and subscribe to the video and hit the notification so you'll know when we're on. We thank you guys. We could not do it without you. Yeah. And thank so, you guys. Thank you. And I, uh, you know, we had a lot of uh, comments. We have Jessica. Yes. There's someone. Jessica. Hey, Jessica. Yes. And Lawanda. Hey, hey, you, number 35. His son is there. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Early on. Yeah. 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 Early on. Yes, there he is. Yes. Number 35. Yeah. We'll be looking for him. And then there's uh, Austin. What, how you pronounce that, y'all? Austin. 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 Austin or Austin? One of the yeah. other. And Listen Lawanda. Ahead. And Renee. All right, Renee. Some of our people you. that gave us comments. You guys, thank you guys. We couldn't do it without you. So we will see you guys next week on Can, Can We, we Talk, talk Let's go.